Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our very last lecture together. It's the end of the summer. Okay, so I just want to start out by giving you some tips about how to approach your final exam, which is on Monday. So let's have a look. First, how should you study for this exam? You have a lot of resources available to you. Um, so I just want to remind you of these resources. So you should reattempt the lecture recap questions on Moodle and refer to the solutions only once you've tried the questions on your own. So those lecture recap questions are their kind of single question per chapter on Moodle. Um, the solutions is just below the question itself. And there's also that um, YouTube playlist where you can see me solving the questions. Um, these questions are intended to be pretty difficult. So they're really good practice for your exam. Um, as well, attempt the exam practice questions and tougher practice MCQs in the ebook. Um, obviously, these aren't for any points for your multiple choice, but um, they're really, really good practice. And that's like tons of questions that you can work through. The next is to review the explicit version of the lecture slides on Moodle for all of the detailed workings on how you solve each type of problem that you'll face. Um, and finally, attempt the additional questions in the ebook at the end of each chapter. So you guys have mostly been doing the review questions in the workshops. Um, so if you haven't already, I would recommend checking out the additional questions as well. And the cool thing about those is that they do have video solutions. So if you're not quite sure um, what the written solution is saying, you can also watch someone solve the question um, on a video. So those are my big uh, recommendations for you. Now here's how you should actually take the exam on the day. Howlin has a nice little blue fish. Let me see if I can post some type of fish or something. I don't know what I my screen wasn't loading, so I just picked anything. Oh, it's a raccoon. Good choice. Okay. All right. So here's my hints for how to do well on the actual exam. So first, each question is worth the same amount. So every single question is worth one course mark. So every question that you get right, add that to your, your course total. Okay. So given that every question is worth the same amount, if you don't know how to do a certain question, you should skip it, right? This is our low hanging fruit principle right here in action. Oops. Get the easy points first, okay? Um, will there be tougher MCQ like questions in the exam? Yeah, for sure, Jay-Z. So the exam is multiple choice and numerical response. So multiple choice we're all familiar with. Numerical response is something like we would ask you for um, to calculate consumer surplus, and then you would type in the value of consumer surplus. Um, the questions will range in difficulty. Some of them, you can look at the question and you don't have to do any problem solving. You just can answer the question very easily within like 10 seconds. Some questions you'll need to have some pen and paper and maybe a calculator and, and really work it out. Um, so because of that, I recommend to kind of look at every question, solve the ones that you can answer pretty quickly, and then go back to the ones that will take a bit more time. Um, so just prioritize getting the easy points. Um, so the next hint is to jump to the end of the question to see what we're actually asking. So some questions will have a bit of a paragraph um, before we get to what we're really wanting you to solve for. Um, so I recommend that you kind of read the last sentence of the question. Um, to see what you should actually be looking for within that paragraph. Okay, the next is be really, really careful about the formatting of the questions. So typically we've been giving you questions with supply and demand curves in the form of P equals whatever. Um, but sometimes we will be a little bit tricky and give you questions with Q equals blah, blah, blah. Um, and if you just kind of go through the motions without really paying attention, you'll get the question wrong. So be really mindful of how we are formatting the questions. And another reminder is, I've been saying it all term, but for your marginal calculations, um, 
remember that you need to divide by that change in quantity denominator. Um, so not every question will have quantity going up in increments of one. The next, actually, I'm just going to pause and look at the questions in the chat. JV says, ah, okay, will those tougher questions be at the end of the exam or will it be scattered? So the questions will be completely randomized and scattered. Um, there's no, there's no order at all. And Muhammad says, for the numerical response questions, do we lose marks if we round up or down? So for numerical response questions, and this is indicated in the final exam uh, tab on Moodle, which will open on Monday morning, um, but it's also available in the practice quiz tab that's available now in Moodle, we want you to round final answers to two decimal places. Um, so keep a couple extra decimals as you're working through the problem from on those intermediate steps and then round your final answer to two decimal places. Um, as well, if the question asks you to find a numerical response and the answer is, for example, 5.5, .5, you don't have to write 5.50. Okay, either one will be correct. We do have a little bit of rounding wiggle room in the marking, um, but yeah, if you're doing intermediate steps, keep a couple extra decimals as you're working the problem. Okay, next, draw a sketch. I'm very pro drawing a sketch, so please have a bit of paper and pen next to you, um, or you can use graphing software if that works better for you, but it's really, really helpful um, to kind of visualize what you're looking at, what intersections you're trying to find, um, which curves you're trying to look at, which areas you need, okay? So please, please take two seconds. It doesn't have to be pretty, but do draw yourself a sketch. Uh, the next is don't leave anything blank, okay? So a blank answer is exactly the same as an incorrect answer. You just get zero points for that. Um, so you might as well submit something, right? Have a guess. Don't leave anything blank. Give yourself a chance to earn the credit. Okay, and finally, kind of obviously, um, please practice each type of question, okay? You will not have time to look up how to solve each question type. Although the exam is open book and open note, um, it's intentionally designed to be tricky to do time-wise, okay? So do not rely on your notes. Make sure that you actually know how to graph each type of market that we're looking for and what are the generic problem solving steps for each type of question okay so practice 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 all right i'm just going to pause here and see if we have any other questions about the exam if not can i get some animals in the chat to show that you're good to go and i'll jump over to our review slides Helen has a pink dragon and a orange cat. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Armand has a nice little puppy dog. Okay, all right, I'll switch over. Of course, as always, hit me with any questions as they come up. We've got a, a horse from Muhammad and a little alien from Jay-Z. Cool, okay. So on Moodle, um, you'll notice that we have um, a big review uh, PowerPoint. And so this is, this is that PowerPoint. Um, it's a bit long. It's almost 200 slides, but uh, this PowerPoint hits kind of every main topic from the entire term. So I hope that you find it helpful. Um, so what I've done is I've kind of um, put a, a number of links in the the PowerPoint so that you can save a bit of study time and kind of jump around to the topics that you want. So this is our, our homepage for the 
the PowerPoint. Um, and then if you click on a specific chapter, for example, if we go to supply, it'll take you to the supply chapter. And when you're done, you can just click the home button and go back to the main section here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna quickly run through the main topics from all 10 chapters. And then what I want you guys to do is post in the chat if I come up with um, a topic that you want um, more specific discussion on, okay? This entire uh, lecture is devoted to you guys. So whatever topics you want me to cover, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so chapter one was about opportunity cost and comparative advantage. So the first thing that we did was we drew a one person PPC. So you spend all your time on apples or all of your time on bananas. How much can you produce in a single day? And we graph our two extreme points, connect those with a line, and that's our PPC. To calculate opportunity cost, remember we can just take the slope of our PPC and that will give us the opportunity cost of the good on the x-axis and then we can just take the reciprocal and that will give us the opportunity cost of the good on the y-axis. Um, remember opportunity cost is the value of the next best alternative. So if you spend some amount of time baking a cake, how many muffins are you not making in that time? That's what opportunity cost is. Then we added a second agent and we compared productivities. So absolute advantage is given the same amount of time who can produce more of the good. Um, and comparative advantage is comparing opportunity costs. So who can bake a cake and sacrifice fewer muffins in the process, right? If one agent has the comparative advantage in one good, that must mean that the other agent has the comparative advantage in the other good, okay? Drawing a two-person PPC, so we have a two-person PPC here graphed. Um, remember that we put the agent that has the lowest opportunity cost of the good on the x-axis first, and only once we've exhausted their full productive capacity do we move on to the next best person, right? So everyone making muffins, everyone making cakes, our best cake maker first, and then our next best cake maker. Okay, remember we want our PPC to get steeper as we move to the right. That's our principle of low-hanging fruit. Okay, um, then we talked about how agents trade, right? Remember agents will trade with each other at a price between their opportunity costs such that they're both being made better off. And then finally we talked about the CPC, the consumption possibilities curve. So this is determined by the market price ratio, right? And we want to specialize in the good in which we have a comparative advantage relative to the market. So if the market can make something cheaply, we'll let the market make that good. We'll specialize in the other good and then trade at the market price to consume whatever bundle of goods we actually want, okay? As soon as the prices in the market change, we may need to change the good that we're specializing in, right? We may need to change what we have the comparative advantage in. Okay, but we always want our CPC to be at or above our PPC. Okay, next is chapter two on supply. So first we introduced our six perfectly competitive market assumptions. And from chapters two through six, we were in the realm of perfect competition. Then we introduced the idea of the cost-benefit principle, which dictates how everyone should make decisions, right? Marginal benefit greater than or equal to marginal cost. We should take whatever action we're considering taking, okay? So from the perspective of an individual firm in perfect competition, they are a price taker. So whatever the market price is, they'll take it and they will produce and produce and produce as their price is their marginal benefit They'll continue to produce until they hit their marginal cost, and that determines their optimal quantity. From there, we pick our heads up and we say, well, how are we doing at this quantity? Are we covering our variable cost of production? If so, we should stay in the market in the short run. And if we're covering our total cost of production, then we should operate in the long run because we're making positive profit. Those, those were our shutdown conditions. 
Next, we talked a little bit about profit. Remember, there's two different ways that we can calculate profit. We can do it in aggregate as total revenue minus total cost, or on a per unit basis, quantity times the difference between your price and your average total cost. Okay? And then we talked about things that will shift our supply curve for when we're just moving along our supply curve. So movements along or some external price change, right? As soon as the price goes up, we are going to have a different profit maximizing quantity. Things that shift our supply curve are things that will affect our marginal cost of production. Okay, remember your supply curve is your marginal cost curve. Then we introduce the idea of elasticity. So elasticity is responsiveness of quantity to changes in price. So our formula for elasticity was P over Q times one over our slope. Okay, there's three different ways that we can classify elasticity. If it's greater than one, then we say it's elastic, equal to one, unit elastic, less than one, inelastic. So not very responsive to price changes. And then we have four determinants of price elasticity of supply. So time horizon, if we have more time, we can be more responsive because we can hire more workers and buy more fixed factors of production. If we have more raw materials readily available, we can easily make more stuff. If our um, factors of production are relatively flexible, meaning that we can shift our machines from making good A to making good B, when the price of B goes up, then we'll be more responsive. Um, and also if we have inventory already prepared, then obviously we can easily sell more units when the price goes up. That leads us into chapter three, which is kind of the opposite of chapter two, but most of the things that apply in chapter two are very similar in chapter three. Okay, so instead of marginal cost, we calculated marginal utility. Remember, marginal utility, like any of our marginals, is the change in our total utility divided by the change in quantity. And we, again, need to be really, really mindful that we're not forgetting about this denominator. Reservation price. Okay, so we used this relationship of marginal utility per dollar of good A relative to marginal utility per dollar of good B in two different ways in this chapter. Way number one was we used it to calculate reservation price. So in this case, we had three of our four values and we were solving for the fourth, right, this price, such that marginal utility of A per dollar is equal to marginal utility per dollar of good B. So we are indifferent between buying the two goods. Okay, the other way that we used this relationship was determining our optimal purchasing pattern. In this case, we knew or we could calculate all four values of this relationship. And what we wanted to do was determine which good gives us the higher marginal utility per dollar. That's the good that we'll buy next. Okay. We wanted to graph our demand curve, which is just our reservation price at every quantity. The way that we do that is we take our total utility and get our marginal utility using this relationship. And then we get our marginal utility per dollar, right? Um, so that's our reservation price. Um, and that's how we graph our demand curve. Then we introduced three different sets of vocab word pairs. So we had the substitution and income effects. The substitution effect being you're buying tea and coffee, the price of tea goes up. So you're going to buy less tea and switch your demand over to buying more coffee, the substitute good because coffee is now relatively less expensive. The income effect is all about our purchasing power. So what happened to our purchasing power and what type of good are we talking about here, right? If our purchasing power goes up, we buy more normal goods and fewer inferior goods. And the opposite is true when our purchasing power goes down. Okay, then we talked about substitute and complement goods. So substitute goods are things where you're gonna buy one or the other. So tea and coffee. Um, if the price of tea goes up, you're going to buy more coffee, right? Your demand curve will, for coffee will shift outwards. Tea and sugar would be an example of complement goods. You consume them together, right? So if the price of tea goes up, you're buying less tea. 
And since you're buying less tea, you're going to need less sugar to go with your tea. So your demand curve for sugar will shift inwards. Okay, and then we talked about shifts and movements along. So a shift of our uh, demand curve will be anything that changes our, our preferences for the good or our, our value for the good. So if there's a positive marketing campaign or if our income goes up and it's a normal good or if our income goes down and it's an inferior good or if a complement goes on sale or if it's substitute becomes more expensive. Okay, and then we talked about demand elasticity as well. Same formula as for supply, just keeping in mind that demand curves tend to have downward sloping. Um, the demand curves tend to be downward sloping, so their slope will be negative. Um, we have four determinants of price elasticity of demand as well. Time horizon is shared between the two. More time makes, means that you're more flexible. Um, the next is availability of substitutes, right? So if there's a lot more substitutes available to you, if the price of one particular good goes up, who cares? You can just switch to something else that's pretty much the same. Um, the next is kind of the definition of a good. So how narrow is your good that you're considering? Is it fat-free, locally sourced almond milk, or is it just milk in general, right? We can easily get a pretty good substitute for fat-free almond milk. Getting a substitute for the entire milk section, a little bit trickier. So it'll be more inelastic, the broader the good type. And then lastly is income share. So how much do we care that the price went up? If something really cheap doubles in price, you might not even notice, and so your quantity won't change by all that much. You're more inelastic for cheap things, and you're more responsive for expensive things. Because you're going to notice when they double in price. Okay, chapter four was equilibrium. So we put supply and demand together to get our equilibrium price and quantity. We talked about how to calculate aggregate demand or supply. Remember, for these types of goods in perfect competition, we're dealing with private goods that are rivalrous. And so we add by quantities, right? If you want a cookie and I want a cookie, we want two cookies, okay? And so we had to convert our equations from P equals to Q equals, add the right-hand side of our equations together, and convert back into P equals if we want a graph, okay? All right, finding equilibrium, set supply equals to demand, and solve. Producer, consumer, and total surplus. So consumer surplus is the area below our demand curve, above the price that we're paying, from quantity zero out to the quantity we are consuming. Producer surplus is the area below the price they receive, above their marginal cost of production, out to the units that they're selling. And total surplus will just be adding that together. Remember that we maximize total surplus at our perfectly competitive market equilibrium. Okay, and that is Pareto efficient, right? Everyone um, acting selfishly in their own best interest will maximize total surplus. So this is our in invisible hand principle at work. Okay, so we talked about Pareto efficiency. Um, essentially, do you see deadweight loss? If you see deadweight loss, this won't be Pareto efficient because you're leaving some surplus on the table. If you do see a deadweight loss, then it's not Pareto efficient, but you can construct some Pareto improving transaction to add surplus to at least one party without taking surplus away from anybody else. Okay, we talked about graphing our market shifts. Remember, this is a really good opportunity to give yourself a little sketch. It doesn't have to be pretty, but you can say, all right, here's my supply, here's my demand. Supply increased, so we shift this way. Demand increased, so we shift this way. And so now we're here, we used to be here. What happened to price and quantity, right? It takes two seconds, but it really helps you visualize. Remember that if you have a double shift, one of price or quantity will be very clear. In this case, quantity clearly goes up. The impact on price isn't as clear, okay? So you'll have one of them that's ambiguous. All right, finally, invisible hand principle at work. This is our kind of discussion of the market graph and our individual firm graph. So in the market, the price is determined at the intersection of supply and demand. This is our price. Individual firms in perfect competition are price takers. So whatever that price is, they're just gonna take it as given. 
we're going to carry this price across and this horizontal line becomes the demand curve faced by an individual firm, right? They can't raise their price because there's a million other people selling the exact same thing for less. And so they would lose all their customers. And in this case, they can't lower their price either because the price is already at the minimum of their average total cost. So any lower than that, then they'd be making negative profit and that's no good. Okay. If we have some positive demand shock, then the price in the market will rise. The price to the individual firm will rise. And again, they're going to produce where P equals MC. So their quantity will now be here at this new quantity and new price you'll see that the price exceeds the average total cost of production. And so this firm will be making positive profit. But because this is a perfectly competitive market, that means that we have free entry and exit. So other firms will see that this is a profitable industry and want to get in on the action. And that is captured as a shift in our supply curve in our overall market. Firms will continue to enter until we get back down to our original price where price is equal to the minimum or average total cost, and therefore our profit will be zero. So there's no more incentive to continue to enter this market. Okay, and so that's why we see our long run supply curve being perfect, perfectly horizontal, perfectly elastic, right? This short run price increase and then decrease, we don't see that in the long run. What we see is the single price here and these two different quantities. Okay, so connecting those two, we get a flat line. That's our long run supply curve. Okay, chapter five. This was government intervention, price floors and ceilings and taxes and subsidies. Okay, remember for a price floor or a price ceiling, one of our parties will definitely be hurt, right? So in a price floor, which is a minimum allowable price in the market, our consumers will definitely be hurt because they're paying a higher price and buying fewer items. Um, the impact on producers is unclear without some numbers. And same deal with the ceiling, but the opposite. Okay, um, taxes and subsidies. So remember, it doesn't actually matter who we're taxing or who we're subsidizing, the market outcome will be the same. You just need to shift one of your curves in the correct direction. So if you're doing a tax question, you want your curves to move closer together. And if you're doing a subsidy question, you want your curve to move further apart. Okay. So a tax is just a wedge between the price consumers are paying and the price that producers are receiving by the size of the tax. So consumers pay PC, take the tax away. That's what's left for producers. Okay. Taxes generate tax revenue for the government being the size of the tax times the number of units that they get to tax. So that's their tax revenue. Taxes also generate deadweight loss because there's units that could be transacted because the reservation price of our consumers still exceeds the reservation price of our producers. Um, but these transactions don't get to take place because they don't leave enough room for the tax amount to also be taken out of that transaction. Okay, and so we see deadweight loss being the size of our tax and the change in our quantity, okay? And then we talked about kind of the relationship between elasticity and tax burden, deadweight loss and tax revenue. So for deadweight loss, for the same size tax, you're gonna get a larger change in quantity if you're taxing an elastic market. So we don't wanna do that because deadweight loss goes to nobody, it's inefficient. You also don't wanna tax an elastic market because you're going to scare away this a lot of quantity of units, and so you're going to be left with a small quantity to tax, and so you're not going to generate much tax revenue. Okay, and then as far as burden is concerned, tax burden is what was the original price, and how does that compare to the price consumers are paying, and the price that producers are receiving. Okay, the more inelastic curve bears more of the tax burden. All right, chapter six on trade. Okay, so first, is the country gonna be an importer or an exporter? So we're just gonna compare the world price versus our domestic price. Okay, remember that as soon as you open your economy to the world market, you're always going to operate at the world price. 
Um, and you're always going to experience gains from trade, right? If you're an exporting country, those gains from trade go to your domestic producers. And if you're an importing country, those gains go to our domestic consumers. Okay. Um, the size of our import or export will just be, we'll plug the world price into your supply curve and into your demand curve. And that gap will be the size of your imports or exports. Okay. Um, impact of a tariff and impact of a quota. So remember, tariffs and quotas are going to be imposed when our domestic producers can't compete, when the world price is less than our domestic price. So a tariff will just be a tax on imported goods. So the price is going to rise to PW plus whatever your tariff is. So that means that quantity supplied will increase, quantity demanded will decrease, the size of your imports will shrink, right? The government gets tariff revenue, just like tax revenue, as the size of our tariff and the quantity of units that we are taxing, which is our imports, okay? Producers gain this area of surplus because they're selling more units and at a higher price. Consumers lose out on a whole bunch of surplus, right? All Everything with a tariff comes at the expense of consumer surplus. We got tariff revenue, and then we've got our deadweight loss triangles on either side of our tariff revenue uh, rectangle in the middle there. So inefficient production, loss in total consumption. Okay, and be mindful that you actually calculate these changes in quantities supplied and quantities demanded. Um, because those deadweight loss areas will not necessarily be the same. Quotas are similar to tariffs, but they're a quantity restriction on the number of units they are allowed to import. Now, remember, we did that kind of long question um, in Chapter 6, doing how to solve a quota, right? So we shift our uh, domestic supply curve horizontally to the right by the size of the quota, S plus our quota, we find the intersection here to get our quantity demanded with the quota. And then we plug that quantity demanded into our demand curve to get the corresponding price. And we cross our fingers and hope that if we plug that price into our original supply curve, we'll get the quantity that is the quota amount less than our quantity demanded. Everything else is the same, just tax revenue, or sorry, tariff revenue will be importer bonus or quota rents with a quota. Chapter 7 on monopoly. Okay, so monopolies are a single firm in the market. We are no longer in perfect competition, right? There's some barrier to entry into our market. That's kind of the most important thing. And so because of this barrier to entry, this firm has market power. They are a price setter. And so they get to choose the price that will maximize their profit. Okay. And so what effect do we see? Well, we see prices that are too high, quantities that are too low relative to our surplus maximizing equilibrium. Okay, relationship between marginal revenue and demand. Remember our really nice, easy shortcut. If our demand curve is P equals 100 minus 2Q, then our marginal revenue curve will be P equals 100. So sharing the same price intercept minus 4Q and double the slope. Okay, monopolies profit maximize where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So in our graph here, marginal revenue in green, supply curve is our marginal cost curve. So at the intersection of marginal revenue and marginal cost, this is our profit maximizing quantity. And remember, we're gonna plug that quantity into our demand curve to get the price that we wanna charge. Do not, plug that quantity back into supply and say this price. That's incorrect. No, no, no. Okay. Um, now, because monopolies are trying to profit maximize and they're producing at this quantity and this price, we are going to see deadweight loss in a monopoly market that is unregulated, right? So we're violating our invisible hand principle because the monopoly acting in their own Self-interest is not maximizing total surplus. Okay. Um, price discrimination. So we had first, second, and third degree price discrimination. So first degree price discrimination is charging every consumer their reservation price. 
In this case, the monopolist is willing to sell to anyone as long as their reservation price is greater than or equal to the firm's marginal cost. And so they're happy to sell to everyone identically to the people that would be sold to in perfect competition. So the last, the quantity of units being transacted is the same as in perfect competition, but everyone is charged an individualized price such that consumer surplus is zero. Now, first degree price discrimination will maximize total surplus, but all of that surplus goes to the producers. Okay, second degree price discrimination, you don't need to be able to calculate it, you just need to be able to recognize it. So this is our, our cues. Remember, quantity or quality of the product. So bulk discounts or offering different levels of quality of a product, right? Different iPhone storage amounts or camera qualities, that would be an example of second degree. And then third degree price discrimination, um, if you remember from our, our slides, we talked about we can't tell everyone's reservation price, but we can tell if you're a lion or you're not a lion, right? We separate our market into smaller sub-markets based on observable characteristics of the consumer. Okay, once we separate our market, we charge a different profit maximizing price and quantity in each of our markets, as if we weren't price discriminating. Okay? All right, government intervention. Why do we intervene in monopoly markets? Well, when we're not um, regulating a monopoly, we're going to see deadweight loss. And so in this case, it's actually an opportunity for the government to uh, make the market more efficient by regulating it, right? In chapters five and six, we saw that the government always screws things up when they're regulating a market. But in this case, regulation will actually make things more efficient. And so the example that we talked about was average cost pricing, where the monopolist has to charge the price and sell the quantity at the intersection of demand and average total cost. Why? Well, we're trying to have the monopoly experience the same profit that they would in perfect competition, right? And so if P equals ATC, then profit is zero. Okay, we can't always get the monopolist to produce the surplus maximizing quantity um, because they may be a natural monopoly where the average total cost is always higher than marginal cost. So we can't get them to charge their marginal cost because it'll make negative profit. Okay, Jay-Z says, sorry, could you explain why maximum profit is when marginal revenue equals marginal cost? Would, wouldn't this be a profit of zero since profit is revenue minus cost? Yes, so profit is revenue minus cost but you will maximize uh, profit when marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Um, marginal revenue is your, your marginal benefit of selling each unit, right? Firms in perfect competition also produce and profit maximize where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. The difference is the marginal revenue for a firm in perfect competition is the market price, right? Every unit that they sell, they get the price. For a monopolist, what they're considering is, okay, I can sell this combination of price and quantity here, and that will give me this amount of total revenue, okay? But I could drop my price a little bit and sell more units. If I do that, then my revenue will look like that. And so I'm considering kind of my loss in revenue there versus my gain in revenue here okay so that's why we have this downward sloping marginal revenue curve so there's we can increase the price and lose quantity or we can decrease the price and gain quantity um and so we're trying to find that balance of where our marginal revenue right our incremental benefit is equal to our incremental cost right so that's just our cost benefit principle in action um but when you actually get to be a price setter. So your marginal revenue isn't your price in a monopoly market because they get to choose what that price is. Um, but no, it wouldn't be a profit of zero. Necessarily.
Um, if you, Jay-Z, are familiar with calculus, you could think about profit it's total revenue minus total cost, as you said. If we want to maximize profit, you want to take the derivative of profit and set it equal to zero. So the derivative of total revenue is marginal revenue, and the derivative of total cost is marginal cost. And so if we're setting the derivative of profit equal to zero, then you're saying zero is marginal revenue minus marginal cost. And so what you're saying is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. I hope that was helpful for you and didn't add to confusion. Chapter eight. Okay, so this was oligopoly. This is our game theory chapter. Um, so we talked about how to solve game matrices. Um, and the way that we talked about doing that was to mark best responses, right? Coming up with a game plan for each player, for each potential strategy played by their opponent, right? So if we're Bonnie, we think Clyde is going to confess. Do we want to confess or deny? We want to confess. And if we think Clyde's going to deny, do we want to confess or deny? We want to confess. And so if our best response to our opponent is always one particular strategy, then that strategy is called a dominant strategy. Okay, in the case of Bonnie and Clyde, this is a prisoner's dilemma. So both players have a best response, or sorry, both players have a dominant strategy, leading to one Nash equilibrium where both players are best responding. And most importantly, that Nash equilibrium is not the socially optimal outcome, right? If they both could just kind of cooperate and deny, they would only go to jail for one year each rather than four years each. The reason that this socially optimal outcome isn't the outcome that we see is because of that incentive to deviate, right? If we are here and Bonnie knows that Clyde is going to deny, Bonnie has this incentive to unilaterally deviate, switching her response from deny to confess and improving her surplus in the process. But Clyde has the exact same incentive and so they will both confess and will end up here. So that's really important features of Nash equilibrium, okay? Um, we also talked about cartel games, which is Mike and Norman here. All right, one second. I have to let Chino out. He's crying. All right, give me two seconds. It's okay, Chino. Go say hi. Okay. All right, so cartel games are a subset of Prisoner's Dilemma games, um, but the strategies are your pricing. Okay? So... How does a cartel operate? Well, if they're trying to maximize their profit, then they will operate as if they were a monopoly, right? Profit maximizing where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, and then pricing along the demand curve at this quantity. Um, and then they just split the profits at the end, okay? So if they did that, in this case with Mike and Norman, they could earn $98 in profit each. But the thing about cartels is that they can't write enforceable contracts. And so there's this really strong temptation to slightly undercut your cartel mate um, and capture the entire market, right? Because they're selling the exact same good. So if you're pricing a little bit less, you get to sell to the entire market, okay? So in this case, they want to kind of undercut each other by dropping their price a bit. That's obviously a better outcome if you get to drop your price and the other guy doesn't, but he's obviously gonna see that you're dropping your price and so he's gonna drop his price to match. And so we end up with lower profit for both firms, and that's going to be our Nash equilibrium. Because again, both players have a dominant strategy of undercutting. So this is why a cartel game is a subset of a Nash equilibrium game, right? All of the features are the same. Dominant strategies, one Nash equilibrium, and it's not the socially optimal outcome. Okay, and then we talked about Coordination games, which are entirely different from Prisoner's Dilemma games. So coordination games, each player's best response depends on the strategy played by their opponent. So we don't see dominant strategies in coordination games, and we see multiple Nash equilibria. Okay? Sometimes one equilibrium will stand out as probably more likely than the other, but in this case, right, it's a bit controversial, right? 
Soccer, soccer is the fairest outcome, but cricket, cricket maximizes total surplus. Okay? All right, so that's chapter eight. Chapter nine is on externalities on Tuesday. Remember, we have four types of externalities. We have positive and negative, we have consumption, and we have production. Okay, so we have four different types. Um, calculate the socially optimal quantity in a market with externalities and this associated deadweight loss. So the socially optimal quantity will be at the social, the intersection of your social curve and your other curve. In this case, our social curve is our marginal social benefit, our demand curve, and our supply curve. So this is our socially optimal outcome. We are adding our marginal external benefit to our private demand curve to get our socially our social demand curve, and we'll set our social demand curve equal to our supply curve to get the socially optimal quantity. Okay? The privately provided quantity will just be the intersection of your private curves, so that'll be here. The deadweight loss will be the size, in this case, of a positive externality of your under provision of the good, right, this change in quantity, and the height of your deadweight loss will be the amount of your marginal external benefit. If it's a negative externality, you would be overproducing this market, or you would be overproducing this good, and you'd have a marginal external cost. Okay? All right, conditions necessary for trade and externalities. So this is our Coase theorem. Essentially, we need a tradable right, and um, we need a small market, right? Chino and Bailey can privately negotiate, um, but you can't negotiate with all smokers in Australia, okay? If you're in a larger market like that, you need government intervention in the form of a tax or a subsidy, right? So we want to tax goods that are overprovided to the market, so negative externalities, and we want to subsidize positive externalities, so we encourage more transactions in that market. Ideally, we perfectly match our tax or our subsidy to the external cost or benefit such that our private decision makers are perfectly internalizing these external costs or benefits. Okay, and chapter 10 was on public goods. So distinguishing between private and public goods. So our two features, is it rivalrous and is it excludable? Okay, rivalrous means if I get a sip of coffee, that's one less sip of coffee for you versus, for example, Bondi Beach, right? I can be at the beach, you can be at the beach, we can fully enjoy the beach, okay? So we need one beach. Excludable, can we keep people from enjoying the benefits if they haven't paid for it, right? Again, I can show up to the beach even if I haven't paid for the beach, um, but I can't have a cup of coffee if I haven't paid for it, okay? We calculate aggregate demand for public goods by doing a vertical summation, so adding by everyone's prices to get the aggregate demand, okay? Again, because they are non-rivalrous. So again, if you wanna to go to the beach and I wanna to go to the beach, we can go to the same beach, right? So the same quantity, okay? So our optimal quantity in the market using our Samuelson condition just says, what is our aggregate demand curve? What's our marginal cost? What's their intersection? That's our optimal quantity, okay? At this socially optimal quantity, if everyone is playing nice, they should pay their Lindahl price, right? Their Lindahl price is at the socially optimal quantity, what is their marginal benefit, okay? You can add the Lindahl prices together to get the marginal cost. All right, but the issue with Public goods is free riding, right? Because you can enjoy the good even if you haven't paid for it because it's non-excludable, okay? And so what we see in public goods markets is that actually the person with the highest demand curve is the only one contributing. So in this case, on this graph, Chino has the highest demand curve. He's willing to provide the most units to this market. And so CC will just free ride on Chino's demand, or Chino's provision of this good, okay? 
When you free ride, you don't pay anything, right? The price that you pay is zero, okay? Free riding occurs because, in this case, Cece's surplus is higher when she free rides and gets to enjoy seven units, right? This is her surplus if she free rides versus if she has to pay her Lindell price and she gets to enjoy that eighth unit of the good, but she has to pay. All right, so there's her surplus if she actually contributes. Okay, so she gets a tiny, tiny little bit of extra surplus here, but she loses out on all of that free surplus down here. Okay, so CC is making a rational decision by choosing to free ride on Chino's provision of the good because her surplus is higher. But again, if everyone is acting in their own self-interest and that doesn't maximize total surplus, um, then that's an, a violation of our invisible hand principle and an opportunity for the government to step in and actually make things better. Okay, remember we will see deadweight loss in public goods markets. The deadweight loss will be this area here. So the size of our deadweight loss in a public goods market will be determined by the size of the under provision of the good. In this case, privately, the good will be provided at seven units, but the socially optimal quantity is eight. And then the height of this deadweight loss will be um, the marginal cost versus the reservation price along the aggregate demand curve at the private quantity of seven. Okay, all right, so I'm going to go home. I'm gonna wait for you guys to ask me questions. So that was a very, very quick recap of all of the topics we've discussed. Hit me with your questions. Armand says, I'm yet to see a question where the person with the lower demand curve is better off paying the Lindell price. Is this always the case? Is it always better for this person to free ride? Good question, Armand. Um, so yes, there are examples um, where the person with the lower demand curve will actually have a higher surplus if they're paying their Lindell price. Um, it tends to be when the two agents have really similar demands. Um, what we've been looking at so far is when one person has a decently high demand and the other person has a much lower demand. Um, and so by paying their Lindell price, the person with that lower demand, the free rider, is only getting like one or two extra units and it's not worth sacrificing those free units that they were enjoying. But if the agents have really, really similar demands, um, then it can be better for them to actually cooperate and pay their Lindell price. What's the usual average for the final exam? Okay, um, it d depends on uh, the, the term. Usually, surprisingly, uh, given the fact that it's so condensed, uh, the summer term actually does tend to have a higher exam average. Um, I don't know if it's you are learning in a condensed time and you really get the material or there's a selection bias happening, but usually the summer term uh, does have a slightly higher average than the rest of the year. Um, it's, but it's, it's a difficult exam. I will be completely honest here. The exam is hard, okay? Um, so I beg you to make use of all of the resources you have available and practice, practice, practice. Make sure that you know how to approach a question and you're not having to look it up when you see the question. Um, give yourself a chance by doing a quick sketch. Um, have your calculator handy and make sure that you're answering the easy questions first so that you're maximizing your points per, per time. Armand says, could you please go over the graphical representation of profit from chapter two? Yeah, let's do it. Let's just do a, a nice little free sketch here. Okay, we've got a quantity, we've got price, we've got our 
marginal cost curve, our average total cost curve, and we've got our average variable cost. <laughs> JC, the speech was not intended to scare you guys. You will, you will do well on the exam, particularly those that are here with me right now. Um, you've been putting in the effort and, and coming to lecture and asking questions. Um, that's a really, really good way to, to prepare. Okay, so Armand, here is your generic curves that you'll see for an individual firm in perfect competition. So you have your marginal cost curve, your average total cost curve, which again will intersect with your marginal cost curve at its minimum. Same story for average variable cost, intersecting marginal cost at its minimum. So a firm in perfect competition profit maximizes where price equals marginal cost. Remember the price for this firm is their marginal revenue. Okay, so there's kind of three different situations that the price could be. Option number one, the price is really low. We'll call this P1. In this case, we're going to produce until P equals MC here. Now, comparing this P1 price to our average variable and our average total costs at this quantity, we can see that this price is below even our average variable cost or production. So at P1, we don't even want to operate in the short run no to short run, right? Because every unit that we're producing, we can't sell it and even recoup our variable cost of production, right? So if you're a bakery, um, if the price of your cookie is $2 and the flour and the sugar and the chocolate chips are $3, you're actively losing more and more money every time you sell a cookie. So you shouldn't sell any cookies, okay? Option number two, nope, I used that color already. Option number two, your price is somewhere here. We'll call this P2. Again, profit maximizing where price equals marginal cost, Q2. In this case, P2 exceeds your average variable cost of production, meaning that your cookie sells for at least as much as it costs you to produce it, um, the flour, the sugar, the eggs. But it doesn't cover your total cost of production, right? So you're not also covering your rent. Okay, so in the short run, you should operate because every cookie will dig you slightly a little bit out of the hole, but you won't be dug all of the way out of the hole. Okay, so you'll still be making negative profit. So in the long run, when your lease comes up for renewal, you don't want to sign that lease. You want to go do something else with your time. And then option number three, your price is somewhere up here. Again, produce, produce, produce until we hit our marginal cost and drop down. At Q3, the price we receive covers both our average variable and our average total costs, and we'll be making positive profit, okay? Profit is calculated either as total revenue minus total cost, total revenue being price times quantity, total cost in this case being average total cost times quantity. So total revenue, would be this green rectangle, right? Price times quantity. Total cost would be average total cost times quantity. So this orange, leaving you with this area here as profit, okay? You can also calculate it directly on a per unit basis as the difference between the price you receive and your average total cost. So this vertical distance here is your profit per unit multiplied by your units gives you your total profit. So quantity times the difference between your price and your average total cost. Armand, I hope that was clear enough for you. Um, okay. Helen, please don't cry. <laughs> that, that little emoji makes me very sad. You guys will do really well on this, on this exam. You just have to prepare. I have seen multiple students get perfect scores on the final exam. Okay. You can do it. 
All right. Um, oh, good, Armand. Okay, Jay-Z says, can we go over how to draw CPCs, namely how to determine the kink point? Yes. Is the supply curve perfectly elastic in the long run, Muhammad? Yes. Perfectly elastic, perfectly horizontal in the long run. Long run supply P equals min ATC. Yes. So it'll be perfectly horizontal at that price level. Jay-Z, let's go to chapter one and talk about CPCs. Okay. So your kink point will actually occur on your PPC, not your CPC. Um, so let's talk about how to draw a two-person PPC. That's where you get your kink point. CPC is, okay, you've drawn your PPC and now you're given this market price ratio. Where do you want to produce to maximize your gains from trade? Okay, so we'll get there. First, two-person PPC. Okay, so we've got bananas, we've got rabbits. Um, now, to draw a two-person PPC, you want to say, okay, if everyone spends their time making only rabbits, that's 12. And then if everyone spends their entire day on bananas, that's 20. Okay? Now, our question to get to our kink point, who do we want making our first banana? Okay? And the person we want making our first banana is the person with the lowest opportunity cost for producing bananas. Okay? So we've already calculated opportunity costs in this table here. So we see that Alberto sacrifices fewer rabbits for every banana that he produces. So we want Alberto to go first. We want him to make bananas. And only if we want more bananas than the total amount that Alberto can make, do we want to get Leo on banana duty. Okay? So Alberto can produce 16 bananas. So we'll put that here. Okay, if he's making 16 bananas, that means that he's not spending any time on rabbits. So we're gonna have to subtract his eight rabbits away from our 12 here, okay? And so we have our three extreme points. Everyone on rabbits, everyone on bananas, and here at this, let me make it further out. Okay, at this point, um, that's our kink point. Okay, this is Alberto's portion of the PPC and this is Leo's. Notice that it, I've tried to draw it such that the PPC gets steeper as you move to the right. Um, Muhammad asks, is it perfectly elastic because the time horizon is long? It's perfectly elastic, Muhammad, because you can in the long run, the price is stable at the minimum of the average total cost. Any demand fluctuation will result in a short run um, price rise or price decrease, depending on which direction demand moves. But in the case of a, of a demand increase, for example, the market price will rise. The market price to the individual firms in that market will rise and they'll make positive profit because the price will exceed their average total cost of production. But if those firms are making positive profit, it's going to be short-lived because this is perfectly competitive. Firms can enter the market and drive the price back down, right? Every time a firm enters the market, supply shifts to the right and the equilibrium price decreases. Firms will continue to enter until the price is driven back down to where P equals average total cost. And then there's no incentive to enter anymore because profits back down to zero. Okay, so in the short run, you do see those price fluctuations, but in the long run, all you see is you can get any quantity at that price equal to the min ATC. Um, Jay-Z says, thank you. Okay, great. Um, remember, CPC is your consumption possibilities curve. So this was when we um, had that example of three different market price scenarios, right? So if rabbits are really expensive in the market, then you want to specialize in rabbits and trade for bananas, right? And how do you decide how many rabbits you can, or sorry, how many bananas you can buy? Well, if you specialize in, in rabbits, you can produce 12. 
sell them for four dollars each that's 48 dollars that's 48 one dollar bananas that you can buy when the market price changes and rabbits are suddenly cheap well the market's really good at producing rabbits which means that you no longer have the comparative advantage in rabbits now you have the comparative advantage in bananas and so you you should switch your specialization choice okay so that's um two-person ppcs and cpcs so just think about at each of their three possible points here where do i make the most money in the market that's where you want to specialize okay All right, more questions. Oh, another thing that I want to point out to you guys about opportunity cost um, is to be really mindful about how we tell you about their productivity. So, for example, we could say you can produce one banana in two hours, or we could say in one hour, you can produce two bananas, right? So those look kind of similar. We've got a one, we've got a two, we've got a one, we've got a two. Um, but these two different productivity statements are totally different, right? So be really mindful about how we're telling you about the productivity, right? My recommendation for most things is to just graph it, right? Give yourself some arbitrary work day if they don't give it to you in the question. You could say, okay, well, let's say I work for eight hours. How many bananas can I actually produce? In the first case, one banana in two hours, that means I can produce four bananas total, right? Whereas this case, in one hour, two bananas. So in eight hours, 16 bananas, okay? Be really, really careful about the units of, of productivity. All right, give me more questions. We have a little bit less than an hour of our lecture left. Hit me with your questions, any question. Can you go over surplus in externalities, please? Specifically, I'm a bit confused about the surplus in negative externalities. Yeah, okay. So let me just draw it on this slide again. Let me just Okay, so let's say that you have quantity, price, you've got your supply curve, you've got your demand curve. Okay, and so your private equilibrium will be here. Okay, um, so if we have a negative externality, remember we can graph it however we want. What we want to represent is that our quantity is too high in the private market. So option number one, you can say, I'm going to add this marginal external cost onto my supply curve. So remember, our supply curve is our marginal cost curve. And so if we're ignoring this marginal external cost, then actually our social supply curve will look something like this. So supply curve social and this vertical distance here being my marginal external cost. We will absolutely go over your subsidy deadweight loss in a second. Good question. Okay, so to satisfy our social cost benefit principle, we really should be operating at the intersection of our demand curve and our social supply curve. So that would be here, quantity social. Okay, so remember our cost benefit principle says we should only take an action for as long as our marginal benefit is greater than or equal to our marginal cost, okay? Privately, we're operating at the purple outcome here, but for all of the units between quantity social and our quantity private, 
we're actually violating our cost benefit principle, right? Because the marginal benefit denoted by our demand curve is less than our marginal cost denoted by our social supply curve, right? Our social cost curve, okay? So for all of these units, we're creating negative surplus because the cost, the marginal cost exceeds the marginal benefit. And so our deadweight loss will be here. Okay. Um, something to kind of think about with uh, externalities. Number one, I always like to think about um, the deadweight loss in externalities looking like an arrow pointing in the direction that we want our quantity to go in. So for negative externality markets, our arrow will be pointing to the left because we're overproducing, okay? So the reason that we see this deadweight loss, again, number one, we're violating our cost benefit principle. Number two, if we look at our surplus areas, so our private consumer surplus will be as usual here, our private Producer surplus will be this area here as usual, but then we have these external parties that are also being impacted by these transactions. And so the total external cost will be the marginal external cost. Ooh, I wanted a different color. The marginal external cost times the number of units that we're transacting privately. And so our external cost will be this area here in orange okay so the orange area overlaps a bit of consumer and producer surplus but the red deadweight loss area isn't being picked up in surplus by the private consumers or producers okay so it's simply an external cost on these third parties with no corresponding benefit okay and so that's why we're seeing that deadweight loss does that make sense, Armand? Okay, I'm... We're all just battling the, the delay here. I'm going to jump to Jay-Z's subsidy question, and I'm happy to go back, Armand, to the um, negative externality surplus question uh, when you respond to the chat. So how did you say we calculate the yellow box? The yellow box is just external cost is just marginal external cost, so $2 per unit of external cost times the quantity private. Why is the deadweight loss not the triangle below? So the deadweight, the deadweight loss arises because for these units, we're violating our cost benefit principle, right? We're creating negative surplus because our marginal cost exceeds our marginal benefit for those units, okay? Um, if you had drawn it differently such that demand was lower, right? If you draw social demand being lower than private demand, um, instead of shifting your supply curve, then you would also get a similar triangle, okay? Um, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. What you want is your deadweight loss to be the marginal external cost times a half, because it's going to be a triangle, times the size of your, your overproduction. Okay, uh, subsidies. Jay-Z, we're hopping to subsidies. Again, very happy to go back, um, talk more about externalities if you would like. Subsidies. Okay. Okay, so subsidies create debate loss for kind of a similar reason that negative externalities do. There's surplus 
that we're violating our cost benefit principle for. Um, and so we're just creating negative surplus, right? So with a subsidy market, again, it doesn't matter who we're subsidizing. We just want to shift one of our curves um, either up or down away from the other curve by the subsidy amount. Remember, subsidies are great for everybody except the government. So producers receive a higher price than they used to. Consumers pay a lower price than they used to. And everyone's buying and selling more units than they used to. Okay. Um, consumer surplus oops, will increase due to a subsidy, right? Previously, it would be the area below demand above the price P star out to the quantity. And then because of the subsidy, they get to pay a lower price and transact more units. So they pick up this area in surplus, C, F, and G. Producers similarly will expand their surplus relative to our equilibrium, right? Previously they have C and D, and suddenly with the subsidy, they get to now receive the higher price P and sell more units. So they get to add B and E to their surplus areas. All of this, of course, comes at the cost of the government having to pay the subsidy amount, right? They pay the subsidized per unit amount times the units that they are subsidizing, right, QS. And so this purple box represents cost to the government. Okay, so producers picked up areas B and E that the government has paid out. Consumers picked up area C, F, and G that the government paid out, and nobody picks up area H in surplus. Okay, so the government has paid this area out and yet nobody has picked it up. Okay, and so that's inefficient. Why else do we see this as inefficient? Because the marginal cost for these units exceeds the marginal benefit for these units. Okay, and so our deadweight loss amount will determine, will be depended by the size of our subsidy and how many extra units. Um, Muhammad asks, for natural monopolies, is the marginal cost always constant? No, but for natural monopolies, the important idea is that average total cost falls as you produce more and more units. It's not constant, but it will be low, your marginal cost. Um, Hao Lin asks for taxation and elasticity. Yeah, good question, Hao Lin. So, Hao Lin, I also recommend for this topic, um, checking out the lecture recap question because it hits on all of these concepts really well. Um, okay, so three points with taxes and elasticity. Um, tax revenue, deadweight loss, and burden. Okay, so tax revenue is going to be the size of your tax times the quantity of units that you get to tax, okay? If you're taxing a really elastic market, an elastic that's particularly responsive to price changes, that means that you're gonna scare away a lot of transactions, right? Because people are gonna go buy a substitute good instead. And so for the same size tax, if you're taxing an elastic market, you're gonna scare away a lot of people and this quantity that you're left to tax is going to be lower. So you're not going to generate as much tax revenue. By a similar token, your deadweight loss is going to be a half times your tax amount times the change in your quantity of units being transacted. Okay, so again, if you're taxing an elastic market that's very responsive to price changes, then this change in quantity will be large, right? And we don't want to make a large deadweight loss because that surplus just goes to nobody. It's totally inefficient. Okay. And then lastly, on tax burden, this is about the relative elasticities of supply and demand, okay? What we're thinking about is what are consumers paying and what did they used to pay? What are, what did producers used to receive and what are they now receiving as the price, okay? 
If we add these two price changes together, we will get the entire tax amount. So on the left graph, our elasticities of supply and demand are pretty similar. And so you notice that the change in price to consumers is pretty similar to the change in price to producers. On the right graph, we have a pretty inelastic demand curve. So it's really steep, okay? But the supply curves are exactly the same. So notice that the price change for consumers is a lot larger than the price change for producers. But again, the total amount is the same. The tax size is the same, okay? Again, same size or same sub supply curves. When we have an elastic market, this change in our quantity of units being transacted is pretty large. So we're creating a lot of deadweight loss and we don't get to tax as many units as opposed to our inelastic market where our deadweight loss is smaller because our change in quantity is smaller. Is that clear, Helen? Okay, thanks. Great. Okay, more questions. You guys are asking really, really good questions. Keep them coming. I'm out of questions. Jay-Z, did I do my job? <laughs> I hope that's good news, Jay-Z. I think it is. Is everyone else out of questions? If you are, we can leave it at, we can leave it here. Um, but otherwise, we got 30 more minutes of opportunity to, to ask me anything that you would like. Please, please take advantage of those explicit lecture slides. Um, I really wanted to kind of clearly tell you how to um, solve each question type kind of step by step. So I really hope that's helpful for you. Helen asks, how is the hardest problem in the exam? Okay. Um, Helen, the tougher practice MCQs in the ebook are, I would say some of them are even harder than questions that you'll see on the final exam. So if you can attempt the tougher practice MCQs, um, and do them relatively quickly and without flaws, then that's a really, really good sign. Uh, we intentionally made those questions to be really difficult. Um, so if you can work those out, they really test that you understand the concepts and kind of can approach the problems forwards or backwards. Um, and so you really, really thoroughly understand the concepts. So that would be my recommendation. I think... <laughs> I think the hardest part of the exam is just is just the time constraint. Um, and so you need to be a bit strategic and a bit efficient in how you solve questions. Um, 
Armand is asking about opportunity cost. Yeah, so Armand, I really, I hate giving like a formulaic response on how to do opportunity cost questions. Um, I mean, I've been doing opportunity cost questions for over a decade and the way that I always do an opportunity cost question is to graph the PPC. Um, the reason that I graph it, number one, is that I can check my units. Um, as I said, kind of one banana in two hours versus one hour, two bananas, um, they mean very different things. And so I don't want to just kind of chuck those numbers into a formula and go from there. What I want to do, let's just say it, one apple in one hour. Okay. What I want to do is I actually just want to graph it. So I want to give myself an eight hour work day and I want to say, I've got bananas, I've got apples. We'll use these two. Okay. If I can do an apple in an hour, in eight hours, I can do eight apples. And if I can do a banana in two hours, in eight hours, I can do four bananas and I've graphed it. Okay. Um, now, if I want the opportunity cost of a banana, of a banana, I just take the slope. So eight over four is two apples. And if I want the opportunity cost of an apple, I just take the reciprocal. Okay. If I wanted to do it the other way with this one, one hour, I get two bananas. So that's 16. If my apple amount is the same, again, just graphing it, my opportunity cost of a banana is eight over 16. So half an apple. Okay, so my recommendation, Armand, is to just graph it. Graph it, take the slope, you're golden. Okay, Daisy says, do binding price ceilings and floors decrease the Pareto efficiency? Otherwise, it wouldn't be binding. Yeah, okay. So if you have a price ceiling, and then a price ceiling is a maximum allowable price in the market, and so for it to be binding, your maximum needs to be less than whatever you're actually operating at. So if we have a price ceiling here, your quantity will be restricted by quantity supply because producers don't like high prices, right? And so you would create deadweight loss because, right, there's units that could be transacted but aren't, okay? If we impose a price ceiling and the market price is $10 and we say that the price ceiling is $20, like you can't charge a price higher than $20, well, who cares? Because you were already charging 10, which is less than 20, right? You're already following the rules of the price ceiling. And so nothing happens. If your ceiling or your floor is binding and your quantity changes, meaning neither of your curves are perfectly inelastic, um, then yes, a binding floor or ceiling will not be Pareto efficient. Don't think of Pareto efficiency as a, like a scale. It's, it's a binary. It's either yes or no. So as soon as you get catch a whiff of deadweight loss, you're not Pareto efficient. Armand, I hope that the opportunity cost recommendation was helpful. If you don't like graphing, you can say, okay, well, how much time does it take me to produce a banana? And okay, if I spend that time producing this banana, how many apples could I have produced in that time? And go from there. Um... Isn't that a redundant term then, since all price ceilings and floors decrease Pareto efficiency? Um, not quite, Jay-Z. So again, if you, if you say that your equilibrium price is $10 and then the government says, um, I'm putting a cap on the price in this market of $20, then nothing happens. It's not binding. 
And so you still operate at your perfectly competitive equilibrium, and so you'll still be pretty efficient. Um, so no for that reason. No for another reason in that if your price ceiling is actually lower than your equilibrium price, so maybe your price ceiling is $5, then the other reason that it might not be Pareto inefficient is if one of your curves is perfectly inelastic, meaning perfectly vertical. So in that case, you would be operating here and then you would be operating here. Okay, and so you're not actually losing any quantity of units being transacted and so you're still gonna be pretty efficient. Uh, Armand says, I think that's helpful. The only thing with graphing is take some time so formulas help to definite graph I need to visualize. Yeah, Armand, it doesn't have to be beautiful. I mean, these graphs are not beautiful and they took me two seconds. Um, but yeah, I would say sacrificing five seconds to make sure that you're doing it correctly is is worthwhile. Daisy is all good. Marvelous. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I'm just going to fill our, um, <laughs> our dead airspace with reminders. Um, if you haven't done the My Experience survey, please do it. It closes at midnight on Friday. Um, I just released an announcement saying that we just hit 50%. So I've added one bonus question and three extra minutes to your exam. Um, so hopefully we can hit the next uh, benchmark of 65% response rate, and then you'll get a second question on your exam, also worth another course mark. So there's just two extra marks floating around on the exam. Um, and then you'll also have more time to work on the exam. So aim for that, nag your friends if they haven't done it already. Um, it really is valuable for us um, to get your feedback. Um, also, please do the practice exam on Moodle uh, just to familiarize yourself with the platform, right? Um, I don't want you guys stressing out on the day because you don't know where things are or how to, how to work things. So just take two seconds, check out the practice exam, and then you'll be good to go when you're doing it for real on Monday. We have a little heart from Helen. All right, well, if you guys are content, we can leave it there. Otherwise, post your questions. I'll wait maybe until 11.35. And if I get no questions, we will close out our very last lecture together. Um, good luck on the exam. Helen, the practice exam totally doesn't count. Um, no, those five marks do not contribute to your course mark. Totally optional. <laughs> What's the consensus with using chat GPT during the finals? So Jay-Z, um, I will say we're not going to proctor you like we're not there's no invigilation for the exam and so you can do whatever you want um as long as you're not colluding with your friends but i will say that the questions are designed such that um there's a bit of kind of critical thinking about what we're actually asking you um and so if you just put the question into chat gpt it may not interpret it correctly and you might get a wrong answer, right? We tested a lot of the tougher practice MCQs in ChatGPT and it, it did not do well on them. So uh, you can use it if you want, but you're at your own peril. Armand says, where do I find the link to the exam on the day? Um, so just like the practice exam tab appeared magically to you on Moodle, same story here. I'll put it right at the top of the Moodle page. Um, and to access the link, you'll need to open the student exam declaration and mark it as done. 
To mark it as done, you have to scroll all the way to the right of Moodle and then click the box and it'll turn green. And then the link will be accessible to you. Yeah, HoloLens says GPT doesn't always give correct answers. Yeah, it really, really doesn't. And particularly for um, the types of questions that we're asking on the exam, it's not not reliable. So I would discourage you from doing that. Yeah. I mean, you can just test it by putting the Tucker Practice MCQs into it and see how badly it does. All righty, are we out of questions? If so, thank you so much for a wonderful term. I really appreciate all of your activity in the lecture chat. It made it wonderful. And I know that online lectures aren't the most interactive space, um, but you guys made it really, really wonderful for me. And I really appreciate it. Um, really best of luck on the final exam. Please ask questions on the course um, the ebook in those comment sections. Um, go to workshop tomorrow with Josh and, and happy studying over the weekend. Make sure to set multiple alarms um, so you don't miss your final exam on Monday. Thanks, Helen. Thanks for the nice blue fish. <laughs> Thanks, Jay-Z. Thanks, Rachel and Chino. <laughs> yeah, Chino really contributed to the, the vibe of the lecture. Yes, good luck, everyone. <laughs> All right, I'm ending it here. Good luck, everyone.